Hi, I'm Matilda Carla, and I'm here today to show you a documentary about the recently discovered gravitational waves and what they imply. I went to the LIGO Observatory in Hanford, Washington to basically understand what happened and what they're discovering and how they discover it. And then I am going to show you what the people that work there have to say about it. First, you will be listening to Carl, who is an expert in the few silica fibers that suspend the mirrors at the end of the tubes, so he makes sure that the mirrors do not move unless a gravitational wave passing by is what moves them. He will first off talk to you about the layout of the interferometer and the different arms and the mid stations and the end stations and what goes where and how they work. Then he will talk to you about what happens when a gravitational wave passes by and how they can detect it. Here are uh, two arms of the LIGO interferometer. So looking down here, you have the first building, which you can see, which is called Med Station X, and that is two kilometers away. And then if you look over to our Y arm, you can see the first Y building is Med Station Y, and then just even further and down over the hill, you can barely see the top of another Y building. That is our end station Y. So that is where our N40 kilogram test masses are that made a few silicon. And this building here is where our laser comes out. So this is the LPEA. <coughs> and what we have here is where our beam splitters, our mode cleaners, all the other complicated small optics are. Okay. So what happens before a gravitational wave passes by is our laser gets split by a beam splitter. It travels all the way down our x arm as well as all the way down a wire. And what happens is the laser then reflects off the mirrors at the end. The mirrors are called test masses. These will direct the laser back towards the start, where it will recombine at the beam splitter and then travel to a photodiode. And then the, the interference pattern that occurs at the photodiode will change if there's any movement or phase change between our two mirrors. So as a gravitational wave passes by, one arm will get shorter while the other arm will get longer. And then this differential change will produce a different interference pattern at the photodiode. And then as a gravitational wave passes by, the two arms will oscillate in length, therefore causing the signal to gradually increase until we hit the peak where the gravitational wave basically hits us, and then it rings down. Now you'll be listening to Mike, who is the administrator of the LIGO Observatory in Hanford. He'll explain more in depth what Carl stated earlier about the interference patterns and how they are really what dictates how they can detect the gravitational waves. So the way an interferometer reads out a signal from its two arms is that you've injected light into the arms of an interferometer and the light combines back at the beam splitter in a way that cancels at the output port. So it's destructive destructively interfering. The light from one arm is destructively interfering at the output port with the light from the other arm. If the arm lengths change, however, due to a gravitational wave or anything that changes the length of the interferometer, trucks driving by on a 240 highway, uh, earthquakes, acoustic noise, there may be real reasons why the arm lengths change. Then light in one arm has a little farther to go, and light in the other arm has a little shorter to go. And so that changes the destructive interference at the output port. No longer is it completely dark. The light doesn't cancel anymore, and light then leaks through at the output port onto some photodiodes, and that's the signature that the arms have changed. If you have one interferometer in Hanford and another interferometer at Livingston, and they do the same thing at essentially the same time, uh, then you have your first evidence that you've got something that's astrophysical and not something that's local to the detector. Now Carl will bring us into the lab where the few silica fibers to suspend the mirrors are fabricated and he'll show us what does what and how it works. Okay, so right now we're gonna go into our silica fiber pooling lab. And this is where we make all our silica fibers that we hang our 40 kilogram test masses on. Okay, so let's go. What we have here is a few silica fiber filling machine. And what um, this machine does is physically makes the few silica fibers that we use to suspend our optics. So what we have is a laser beam coming in, 
It will then hit this mirror in the middle, which is at 45 degrees. Which I point into there. So this actually rotates quite fast. It comes out of itself. I think it's about 80 times a second. And what that does is it spins the beam out to this conical mirror, which is a 45 um, degree mirror. That will then um, shoot it up. Shoot it up to form a cylindrical beam. The cylindrical beam will then hit off this conical mirror towards the stock. So this stock in the middle is made out of fused silica, and this is what we use to make our fibers. So the laser will heat up in the middle, at which point the top stage of the pill machine will then pull this apart to create a fiber which is uh, over here. So what we have is a 400 micron or 0.4 millimeter. Uh, Sorry, I'm so yeah. that I can see it. Right? So this is a 400 micron or 0.4 millimeter fused silica fiber. And what we have is four of these that suspend the 40 kilogram optics. So, right there. so if we just look over here, we have a lot of of our 40 kilogram test mass. So this whole thing so, is 40 kilograms? No, no, the mirror. So these mirrors, well, this is just a block of aluminium, but in the real thing, this is a fused silica mirror, which is 40 kilograms. And this is another 40 kilograms? And then that's another, yeah. So if we come to the side, you can actually see the fibers. Fatal, okay. So these are four, uh, 400 microns in diameter, all holding 40 kilograms. So really, really thin, but extremely strong. Okay. And what laser are we using to heat up? We are using a 100 watt uh, CO2 laser. So it's an infrared beam. So we can't physically see the laser beam. So we have a red alignment laser. You can see reflecting here, and that we use as a reference point. Perfect. Here's a mock-up model for one of the two mirrors found at the end of the X and Y arms that are used to reflect the laser light back and forth to make sure the experiment goes well. This is only a model though because actually entering the bay where the mirrors are found could cause contamination which could absolutely ruin the outcome of the experiments to find the gravitational waves. So what we have at the top here are metal and cantilever blades. These will eliminate vertical motion that we experience. So these can be caused by, say, an earthquake or something that passes through. Um, we then have another set to counteract um, this, this, these motions as well. But then we have our penultimate test mass at the top, which is made up of fused silica. These are where the um, fused silica fibers are attached to. So it's attached from the top test mass down to the bottom test mass. In this model, they're actually just made of steel. Yeah. So they're made out of metal in this case, just because it's a mock-up. Got it. Of it. And so this, on the other hand, is a 40 kilogram mm -hmm. test mass, the ultimate test mass, where it's made of fused silica and the mirror is reflected, right? And yeah. er, the laser beam is reflected back to the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Perfect. So we use this pendulum system, so essentially, for these to counteract um, the motion of the mirror. So this is the main bay, which houses most of the facility's high-tech equipment. In here, there are many different vacuum chambers with lasers bouncing back and forth on small office tables, which will later be explained by Aiden. But for the time being, we are with Mike again, seeing what the main bay consists of and its main parts. So uh, the, the main laser is housed inside this acoustic enclosure, and it's the acoustic enclosure present, prevents sound as noise getting into the, the laser. The optics get jangled around if you don't have the acoustic enclosure and that gets sent into the interferometer, amplified as noise and brought out. So it lives inside an acoustic enclosure. And then this is the input arm behind me. So optics here prepare the light to be injected into the interferometer. Uh, then the light is incident on the beam splitter, which is really this first tall chamber here. I don't know if you can see the laser pointer light. That's the place where the light gets split. So really half the power is transmitted two and a half miles down to an end mirror and half the power is reflected in this direction, what we call the wire. And 
and the light recombines at the output. So when we're running an uh, ob uh, observation mode, all the lights are off, all the spinning media are stopped inside this uh, hall, and uh, any, any sound you hear would be quiet. Um, it's all uh, in order to isolate the interferometer. You're trying to recreate the experiment of, of test masses just in deep space with no forces acting on them, seeing evidence for the passage of a gravitational wave. So you're effectively trying to recreate that by making this environment as quiet as possible. Um, okay, so my name is Aidan Brooks. I'm a staff scientist at Caltech, and this is uh, I'm responsible for the thermal compensation system. So this is one of the components of thermal compensation systems. This is a set of sensors on here that we use for measuring temperature changes in the in test mass. And the basic idea is we start with uh, a laser diode in here. Uh, it's a superluminescent fiber coupled diode. Uh, it comes the beam comes through this yellow fiber. That's right. And it's launched from this uh, fiber launcher in here. And we create a probe beam with that that goes through a series of optics in here and eventually goes up the periscope and into the vacuum system. And once it's in there, it's injected through a series of optics into the interferometer. It goes all the way down to the uh, test mass. This particular one goes to ITMY. That set over there goes to ITMX. It goes into the test mass, reflects off the front surface, the uh, HR surface, and then comes all the way out again. And then the beam comes all the way back to this op this device back here. This is called a Hartman sensor, and this is at uh, an image plane of the uh, of the ITM. And we measure changes in the wave front, so it's a, it gives us a spatial map of uh, optical changes, whether the, the optic is getting thicker or thinner, um, and, and it's usually in response to thermal effects. So we have different actuators that allow us to change the wave front, but what we're principally interested in is whether the, the wave front itself is changing because the interferometer is heating up. What we found recently was not only was it heating up because of uh, absorption of the, the light, the main interferometer light, but there was a piece of dust or something like that on the optic that was severely distorting the wavefront. So all the work that we've been doing over the last week has been going in to clean that, and now we're just recovering this, this system as well. So. so what this does is it makes sure that there's no pollution in the interferometer and that the temperature stays steady in there? It's not so much that the temperature stays steady, it's that the um, the temperature distribution doesn't have a big gradient. We don't mind if the, the overall temperature goes up or down uniformly, but if we get a really like a hot spot, we get a big gradient, that's that's a problem. So this is this is measuring the gradient, not so much like the absolute temperature. Right. But it's kind of sometimes just easier to say it measures the temperature distribution. So. Thank you. No worries. What Aiden just showed us is just one of the small activity tables in charge of one task. There are many more of these scattered throughout the main bay and even all the other bays and even the facility. This comes to show just how detailed this experiment is and how much every little smallest detail matters to the outcome which is detecting gravitational waves. Okay, so the, the laser enclosure where the light originates is back in this bay behind me and light is then injected onto the interferometer in one of these neighboring chambers that houses the beam splitter. Uh, that splits half the light into one arm and half the light into the other. So the light that transmits through the beam splitter goes along down this arm here that you're seeing. This is the transmitted or the X arm. It heads out of the building here and then runs two and a half miles where it's an end mirror and then resonates. The light bounces back and forth in this X arm about 300 times. Now likewise, the light that's reflected off of the beam splitter up the Y arm goes out the building here, this far uh, portal, and the light resonates back and forth about 300 times on that arm as well. It then recombines at the beam splitter, and normally the light cancels, so the output is dark at this far bay, the, the, the back bay here. That's where the gravitational wave signal is. Uh, when a gravitational wave goes by and modulates the space between the beam splitter and the end mirrors, expanding it, contracting it, 
uh, then that light leaks through at the output port and all of the astrophysics of that source, whether it's binary black holes or whatever else we'll discover, it's all encoded in the light at the output port of the inner proton. And what is that other piece and that piece right there and all these things that we see down so here? These other components are really a second vertex for a second interferometer. So this is the main laser enclosure for the second interferometer. This is the input stage here. Here's the beam splitter for a second interferometer. Input mirrors in those chambers behind me, but right there and this one over here. The whole point was that in that same vacuum envelope, you could get an additional interferometer, a second interferometer. Early in advanced LIGO in 2011 or so, we opted to store those components instead of installing them into the vacuum envelope. And you can see those components in, existing in these cylindrical tanks under nitrogen purge to keep them from corroding. And uh, we're landing those components in India. India is now in the process of building up a site with vacuum tubes and chambers and buildings and staff, all in order to house these components. The whole point of this is that if you build another interferometer, a third site, you get better localization in the sky of where your gravitational waves are coming from. Instead of having a big swatch on the sky where we think those gravitational waves are coming from, and LIGO India and LIGO and Virgo that's coming online and Tigra um, will work together to identify where in the sky gravitational wave sources are coming from. And once we do that, we can point electromagnetic telescopes to those sites and ultimately learn more things about the uh, events that we're detecting. We'll see them not in just gravitational waves, but also in gamma rays or radio waves or visible light. So overall, how much money would you say has been spent in creating LIGO here in Hanford? So, uh, well, if we include Hanford and Livingston and Caltech and MIT, the whole laboratory, uh, it, the, the actual initial LIGO costs $360 million, the upgrade costs $205 million, plus $55 million in international contributions. So over a half a billion dollars in just the laboratories themselves. Uh, and then we have an operating grant on the order of 40 million per year. Uh, and so all told, there is closing on a billion dollars invested in gravitational wave astronomy uh, in the United States. That's through the National Science Foundation, so it's publicly uh, funded money. And so that's a, a really big contribution in order to you know, open this field of gravitational wave astronomy. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you were able to understand, even if just a little bit more, about how this vast universe works. Once again, thank you for watching and have a good day.